Hello, is coffee good or bad for your heart? Can you drink coffee if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, or heart arrhythmia? How much coffee can you drink a day without risking your health? Does coffee cause cancer or reduce cancer risk? How long does caffeine stay in your body? Does decaf coffee have the same risks and benefits as regular coffee? What is the best way to prepare coffee for your health? And from what time should you avoid drinking coffee and why? Well, these and other questions I will answer in this video, and you will also learn a little about the history of coffee. It will be very complete, and if you like coffee, you will have several reasons to celebrate. So stay until the end. I promise the video will be exciting. But first, enjoy the video. Let's make this video the channel's record holder. Can we get past 390,000 likes? Reach 400,000 likes? Help there. And also, spread this video to your friends and family. Americans love coffee. Coffee is not only a national passion but also a global one. Brazil is the primary coffee producer in the world. More than one-third of world production comes from Brazil. And you will see that coffee has many benefits for your health. Then distribute it forcefully. And tell me. You like coffee a lot, can't you function without coffee? Or don't care about coffee? What part of the United States or the world are you from? Could you write it down there? Come on. Is coffee good or bad for health? It depends on the dose, but coffee has far more benefits than risks. In the past, coffee studies looked like a seesaw. At one time, they said it was good, at another time, it was terrible. But in the last decade, that seesaw has come to a halt. Coffee is good. To give you an idea, until 1991, coffee was included in the WHO's list of possible carcinogens because several population studies showed that those who drank coffee had a higher risk of cancer. It wasn't until much later, when studies started to separate coffee and cigarettes, that they found that, contrary to what was previously thought, there was a decreased risk of certain types of cancer for those people who drank coffee. Remember that smoking and drinking coffee usually went hand in hand. When you drink coffee, you're not just drinking water and caffeine. Coffee is also an excellent dietary source of vitamin B2, riboflavin, B3, magnesium, and potassium. Caffeine is just one of over a thousand chemicals in coffee. There are good things and bad things. The good things are the polyphenols and antioxidants, which can reduce inflammation and inhibit the growth of cancer cells. However, unbrewed coffee may have diterpenes that can increase bad LDL cholesterol and slightly lower good HDL cholesterol. Does this have any impact? I think not. What types of cancer can coffee reduce risk? liver cancer, because it reduces the risk of steatosis and fibrosis. Melanoma, which is the most severe skin cancer. Endometrial cancer, because coffee is associated with decreased circulating estrogen levels. Bowel cancer, because coffee stimulates the production of bile acids and speeds up intestinal transit. Which can reduce the amount of carcinogens that come into contact with colon and prostate cancer. Reduce risk, not zero. I'm sure there will be comments saying, my neighbor drank liters and liters of coffee and still died of liver cancer. It reduces the risk, not zero. What else can coffee bring to your health? It may reduce your risk of Parkinson's disease. It causes tremors, rigidity, and bradykinesia. Low levels of dopamine are implicated in this disease. Several studies have shown that higher caffeine consumption is associated with a 25% lower risk of developing PD. It appears that caffeine protects the brain cells that produce dopamine. Another study showed that men who drank six or more cups of coffee had a 58% lower risk of Parkinson's disease. In women, smaller intakes of 1-3 cups are already protected. Remembering that each 240 milliliters cup of brewed coffee has about 95 milligrams of caffeine. Espresso has the highest concentration of caffeine. A moderate amount of coffee is generally defined as 3-5 cups a day or an average of 400 milligrams of caffeine. The men in the study were overreacting and Alzheimer's? Well, Alzheimer's is a little more complex, our coffee protects less. The results suggested a trend towards a protective effect of coffee against dementia, but not as straightforward as Parkinson's. Coffee can also reduce your risk of depression and suicide. When you drink coffee, you are more euphoric, increase alertness and alertness, and improve your mood. A moderate caffeine intake of less than six cups of coffee a day has been linked to a lower risk of depression and suicide. In a meta-analysis of more than 330,000 participants, the authors found a 24% reduction in the risk of depression when comparing the highest coffee intake, 
4.5 cups per day, with the lowest, less than 1 cup. When compared with non-coffee drinkers, the combined risk of suicide was 45% lower among those who drank 2 to 3 cups a day and 53% lower among those who drank 4 or more cups a day. And see that caffeine was the critical factor because there was no relationship for those who drank decaf. In addition, coffee can reduce gallbladder stone risk. As I said, coffee stimulates contractions in the gallbladder and increases the flow of bile, preventing cholesterol from accumulating and forming stones. It may reduce liver disease such as fatty liver, the fatty liver, fibrosis, cirrhosis, chronic liver disease, and liver cancer. It may reduce your risk of diabetes. Studies have shown an up to 33% reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes. Better process glucose, or sugar. Caffeinated coffee showed a slightly more significant benefit than decaf coffee. It can help you lose weight because it increases blood leptin, and caffeine also reduces hunger reduces cardiovascular disease. Moderate coffee consumption of 2-3 cups a day was associated with a 21% reduction in the risk of heart disease. And also stroke. The Nurses Health study showed that drinking 4 or more cups of coffee a day was associated with a 20% lower risk of stroke compared to non-drinkers. So, putting it all together reduces early death. In fact, in several studies conducted around the world, consuming 4 or 5 cups of coffee, are about 400 mg of caffeine, a day was associated with reduced death rates. In a study of more than 200,000 participants followed for up to 30 years, those who drank 3-5 to five cups of coffee a day, with or without caffeine, were 15% less likely to die early from all causes than people who avoided coffee. A JAMA study examined the coffee habits of nearly 500,000 people in the United States and found that it didn't matter whether they drank a cup or six, with or without caffeine or if they were fast or slow metabolizers of caffeine. They were linked to a lower risk of death from all causes. But, of course, coffee doesn't just bring benefits. Harm. Let's start with the pressure. When you drink coffee, your blood pressure will rise between 30 minutes and 3 hours later. But coffee will cause hypertension. For the vast majority of people, no. There is an American study showing that for some people, it can increase the risk. But if you had coffee and an hour later your blood pressure was high, it could be because of the caffeine. Palpitations Large amounts of caffeine can cause unwanted heart palpitations in some people. However, studies are showing that those who drink coffee regularly have a lower risk of arrhythmias than those who don't. The point here is an exaggeration. Pregnancy changes the way the body metabolizes caffeine, and pregnant women are advised to limit their caffeine intake to less than 200 mg per day. Caffeine crosses the placenta, and drinking coffee during pregnancy can increase your risk of miscarriage, low birth weight, and preterm birth. Reflux of caffeine from coffee, tea, or soda increases heartburn symptoms because it stimulates the secretion of hydrochloric acid. So, if you suffer from reflux, it's a good idea to avoid coffee or at least limit your intake. Changes our perception of sweets Caffeine can change our perception of taste, making sweet things seem less sweet. The danger here is overdoing it with sweets and blaming it on caffeine. Fatigue low to moderate doses of caffeine improves our alertness, energy, and ability to concentrate. But, very high doses can increase anxiety agitation and can even cause chronic fatigue. If you go over the amount, if you squeeze too hard, you can dust so much that the most common harmful effect associated with coffee is insomnia. Because, caffeine blocks the same receptor in the brain that adenosine acts on. Adenosine is a natural sedative. It has a hypnotic effect on the brain and makes neurons fire less frequently. It's adenosine that will make you want to sleep. The pressure of sleep will make your brain less alert and slower. As the day goes on, our body produces adenosine until it turns off. Caffeine locks into adenosine receptors, preventing adenosine from acting. But you see, adenosine is going to keep going up, it's going to keep building up. Even so, if you have caffeine circulating, you will feel alert. In fact, caffeine tricks our brains. He thinks he's all right, but he's actually got that adenosine rush coming on. So if you take caffeine at the wrong time, you'll block adenosine receptors and make your sleep worse, even if you think the coffee isn't working, even if you're not sensitive to caffeine or a fast metabolizer. Avoid drinking coffee after 2 p.m. The half-life of coffee is about 4-6 hours, and a quarter-life of coffee is 12 hours. So, if midday you had a cup of coffee at midnight, 25% is still circulating in your body, which can have an impact on your sleep. 
so much so that if you have coffee circulating while you are sleeping, you worsen the slow waves by up to 20%, that is, you are having the sleep of a person much older than you. Does adding other things like milk or sugar cancel out the benefits? It depends. A 2015 study found that those who added sugar, cream, or milk had the same benefits as those who drank black coffee. But you see, a spoonful of sugar is not the same as going to Starbucks and having 500 milliliters of coffee with whipped cream, syrups, and other things. Indeed, that high-calorie coffee should be included in that 2015 study. Does the way coffee is prepared matter? Yup. As I said, brewed coffee is better for your health because the filter removes some substances that can worsen your cholesterol. Is coffee addictive? Yup. If you're like me, you've probably tried quitting a few times in the past. You may have had withdrawal symptoms like headache, fatigue, irritability, difficulty concentrating, and a depressed mood. Why does coffee make you want to go to the bathroom? About 30% of coffee accelerates intestinal activity quickly, including decaf coffee, increasing the urge to defecate because of the gastrocolic reflex, which is a normal response to food. Still, for some people, coffee has a wildly exaggerated effect. How has coffee changed our society? Have you thought about it? Coffee has changed our community a lot. I'm not exaggerating. Coffee was discovered in Ethiopia in the 9th century. A Chaldee goat herder noticed that when his goats ate certain red fruits, they behaved strangely, much more active and sleepless. Chaldee reported his findings to the abbot of the local monastery, decided to make a drink from the fruit, and found that it kept him alert during the long hours of prayer at night. So, the discovery was entirely by chance. In the 15th century, coffee was already known in Persia, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey. So much so that Constantinople, now Istanbul, had many cafes that were important places for the exchange of information. The Arabs saw coffee as an opposition to wine, which was outlawed in the Koran. From Constantinople, coffee arrived in Venice in 1629. In 1650, it came to London, which became a city full of cafes. In London, there was about one coffee shop for every 200 Londoners. So much so that in England, it was only in the 18th century that tea overtook coffee as the primary source of caffeine, mainly because the British Empire had no colonies to grow coffee. In fact, the Arabs had a monopoly on coffee because they roasted the beans, ensuring that they could not be germinated. It was not until 1616 that a Dutchman smuggled coffee plants from Mocha, in Yemen, cloned them in Amsterdam, and then planted the seedlings in Java, forming Mocha Java. It was so challenging to have a coffee plant in Europe that it was only in 1714 that King Louis XIV, the Sun King, got a seedling in Versailles. The history of coffee is fascinating. When it was pruned, it was also cloned and taken to Martinique in the French Caribbean, where it thrived. Coffee, or rather caffeine, sharpened mines clouded by alcohol because they gave alcohol to workers, as the water was polluted. By boiling water to make coffee or tea, there was a reduction in waterborne infectious diseases. Coffee and tea played a role in the Industrial Revolution, so much so that it's hard to imagine the Industrial Revolution without caffeine. Along with artificial light, coffee or caffeine kept workers awake during the night, making them more productive. Energized thinkers like Voltaire, who drank about 50 cups of coffee a day, in addition to making people more focused and alert, improved physical and mental performance. Indeed, there would be no car, computer, cell phone, much less this video, if it weren't for Caldi's goats. Did you like the video? Remember to share so more people have this knowledge. And what's the following video you'll watch? I'll leave two recommendations here on the side equals my video about signs of prediabetes, in which I talk about insulin resistance and how to reverse it, and my video about 10 benefits when you stop eating sugar. Remember to subscribe. And until the following video. Thank you very much.